Once upon a time, Caitlin and Danny were brought together by fate to live their best lives. Now, the BFFs, turned bloggers and lifestyle influencers, are sharing their sparkle with you. Welcome to Doll Talk. I'm Caitlin. And I'm Danny. This episode, we're going to attempt to talk about difficult conversations. It's our prerogative to lead with love, compassion, and understanding. This is part of our effort to amplify the African-American community in honor of the Black Lives Matter movement. Because silence is compliance, we want to open the door to new, difficult, and even uncomfortable conversations. It is when we are uncomfortable that we, as a society, can grow the most. We are honored to have our first guest join us today. We first met Quan Bailey two years ago working on Strength in the City a traveling fitness festival. Quan was a lead trainer who also helped with production, and we managed the social media through our sister company, Dollhouse Social. Quan is now a personal trainer in LA. As a black man, he is using his voice to positively impact the movement. Quan is an inspirational human being. He is open and strong and honest. All right, let's see where the conversation takes us. Quan, welcome to the Doll Talk podcast. We're so happy to have you here and happy that you're willing to share your experiences with the Doll Talk community because I think we could really all benefit from what you have to say. So first up, I know that you've been pretty active cleaning up the community in LA. If you want to talk about that, uh, we'd love to hear your perspective. I feel like, you know, with all the destruction that happened and, um, you know, there's a difference between peaceful protests and, and people who take advantage of a situation and steal things for themselves. Because I've wanted to live here for so long, I wanted to live in Santa Monica for, I don't know, three years now. I finally make it here and then I come outside and it's all destroyed, right? It's all destroyed and people claim they're destroying it for, for me, you know, for people like me, right? I just felt overwhelmed, this overwhelming energy to go clean up. So that's what we did. We went out there and um, there were already like 150 to 200 people on their way out. The community kind of rose up on its own. The city sent out an Instagram post, but it wasn't very, you know, organized or anything. It was like, hey, come out and clean if you can. Please bring a broom. And before you know it, you know, we're all painting. Like, I've never painted before. It was hilarious, but we're painting, and everyone's, like, hugging. And, you know, you got business owners crying. They're trying, to, they're trying to go and help a business owner, but they're like, please don't help us because we have to wait for our insurance to come. Otherwise, if you guys clean it up before the insurance comes, we can't do it. So, you know, you're just kind of consoling people and just watching this community that is very mixed come together and, and uh, show nothing but love was pretty awesome. That's amazing. So we have followed you closely, not only because we genuinely care about you and love you, but because it's interesting for us to see the difference between what took place in Chicago and what's taking place in Chicago versus what's going on in LA. Um, Chicago, in my opinion, was very brutal, but LA was even more brutal. And an issue that Caitlin and I have is we don't understand what is real, what is not real. There's a lot of like misinformation out there. So Mm -hmm. I saw, um, officers shooting groups of people standing around with paintballs. I heard a story that there was peaceful protests and then these police officers in the area you're in were kneeling with people and participating. And then 45 minutes after those video and photo ops were shooting rubber bullets and tear gassing these peaceful protesters. So um, what, what, happened (laughs) well all i can speak on of course is my perception of it right i can't Mm -hmm. speak for an entire group of people but from what i understand from the protests that i saw and got to walk through briefly most of the protests i saw were pretty peaceful um Mm -hmm. but i think with the institution of curfews i think a lot of governments covered their butts by doing these curfews but they would institute them 45 minutes before they were in 
So let's say you're in downtown Chicago and the bridges right. are lifted and they say you need to go home in 45 minutes. Where, where are you going to go in Chicago in 45 minutes? Right? Not so they come places. out and they say, if you're not gone by the, you know, by the curfew, we're going to use force to remove you is basically what they were saying. So that's mm -hmm. when you saw, from my perspective, that's when you saw people getting shot with rubber bullets, you know, thrown to the ground and stuff like that. And I feel like the police didn't take it violent until the looters who took advantage started in the beginning. So I feel like we really should look at the individual cops that overstepped, right? People who were doing stuff that they shouldn't have been doing, like attacking people. The people who were attacking police as well. Remember, there's so many sides to this and there's so mm -hmm. much history to this that it's just so hard to narrow in on like what happened right. you know, when this is all going on nationwide, right? So I just say we have to look at each individual case and kind of figure out what happened in each interaction. I feel like the cities and, and governments, though, with their whole, with the curfews, I think that wasn't done correctly. You can't deploy, you know, all these polices before the National Guard, I'm talking the police, mm -hmm. into these situations where they're trapped in there with protesters. It's going to get violent. You're putting, you know, piranhas in a, in a thing together. They're going to bite each other. You know what I mean? They right. trapped people in a certain boroughs and certain areas where all they could do was fight. So right. that, that, that was the part where I kind of didn't understand why that was happening. Another thing that Caitlin and I have been trying to navigate, and we know talking with you is a safe space, I have known to call someone of color African American. Yeah. And with this all happening, everyone has gone to the word black, uh -huh. black community. And for me, I'm trying to understand because I feel like that is more of what I would consider like a racist type of comment. Right. Because no I, one's technically black. Right. Yes. Well, no one, like, I've just known you're African American, but then I yeah. look at myself and I look at Caitlin and I'm like, but you would call us white people. Like, very rarely is everyone like, oh, there's a Caucasian, you know? Right. So I'm just interested in why that's acceptable now to be using the term black when I still am constantly saying African-American and am I wrong like from you being the one being receptive of everyone coming together now and being allies are we saying is this the right thing to be saying I think it's person to person I feel like depending on you know where you were raised and where you're from I feel like it that's just one of those things where a name could be different. I mean, clearly we're using the term black for Black Lives Matter and a lot of the movements, but I, I think African-American is perfectly fine. I think black people is, is perfectly fine. Uh, just as long as it's not in an accusatory tone, like mm -hmm. I hate black people, like, whoa, okay, you can't say it like that. You know what I mean? Or I hate white people. Like I think when we use these colors to, to um, identify people, I feel like they can come off as not caring Mm -hmm. But also, I feel mm -hmm. like we're using Black Lives Matter as a kind of a movement and as a place to come together in something that's easily recognizable. It almost feels more of like a, a, a way to wrap it up better than saying African American Lives Matter. Like it's, it's easier to it's just, got it. bundle it up together. I don't know if it's necessarily saying one term is worse than the other. Got it. Yeah, I was curious about that because I was like, wait, I've never been like, oh, black person high five you know like it's right. never been and I feel like that's like what is happening now and mm -hmm. I just am you know curious of thank you for clearing that up because I don't I I want to be a part of the solution and so does Caitlin because one thing that we have been observing through all of this is a lot of the problem as you mentioned is from a very long deep rooted issue that our generation your generation mine yeah. caitlin's we're all part of the same one i feel like we're more accepting we're more loving like we look at you know lesbians and gays and love is love we yeah. look at every culture and respect and understand what we have gained from that culture over time but there's also like this mass rage against people like Caitlin and myself saying that like you need to do more you don't understand mm. and we want to do that well I do feel like something very different about the Black Lives Matter 
movement is that black people have really called on white people and people of all different races to be part of the movement together. I don't think any other time in history has that happened. And that's why I think this is going to be stronger than ever and hopefully, hopefully create more love and acceptance at the end of the day. But I I could see... I could see in the past if Danny and I tried to perhaps participate in helping a similar movement, I could see someone being like, what are these two little white girls doing here? Like, what are they doing here? Mm. And the fact that the black community is really encouraging everyone to step up to the plate to educate themselves, to help educate other people, and to stand hand in hand with the black community, I feel like that is really going to make a difference because ultimately we're all here for each other. I agree. But I do want to, I would help with something. So here's, Please. here's something that is pretty, is, is people forget a lot. So in the, I call it the golden age of the civil rights movement, right? Mm-hmm. Like the, you know, fifties to late fifties to early seventies, I would say it's part that a lot of people are quoting from a lot of people are pulling information from right now. What people don't understand is there were white people out there and there were a lot of them. And the thing was though, because of how racially tense the time was, those people faced a physical backlash as well. So if you were supporting you know, an African-American person or a black person, you, the police were beating you in the street just like they were beating them. There was no, like there wasn't as, there was different, sometimes of course people would take care of people of course, but you know, I've had a grandmother who was out there, you know, I've had family members who remember and can explain and tell you, coming up as a kid, that there are people out there. Of course, there are more now, for Mm -hmm. sure, but civil rights has always been for everyone. And I think I I don't want that to be lost in the narrative now. Like, it's always been about everyone. Um, And then with the community, I just, I'm just very proud of how people did come together this week. I, I don't want it to be snuffed out that like, because of the violence that it didn't matter, it was bad. Like mm-hmm. you saw so many people coming from a place of love. And I just, oh, yeah. I really want to make sure that gets attention. And you mentioned a little bit about the difference between like a peaceful protest, rioters <laughs> and looters. I yeah. do struggle with it because... I understand that there are people taking advantage of the situation, but I also understand that we might not be having these conversations the same way we are now if our entire country wasn't in turmoil. Oh, can I? Oh, I love this. Okay, so I actually mentioned this in a YouTube video recently, and what I said was, it's my favorite thing, sorry, I, I try to paint a picture. The reason why I don't like looters is because if we're saying, let's take it back to George Floyd, George Floyd's murder in the street. Mm -hmm. We burn down buildings to say that your institutions are not more important than our lives. That is why you riot. That is why we burn things. That's why it happens. I may not necessarily agree with it, but I understand it, right? Mm -hmm. But if you go and loot somewhere and take things for yourself, you're basically saying that George Floyd's death was an opportunity for me to get the things that I want, not going against the establishment. So to go against the establishment, the thing to do would be, okay, let's say I, 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 I'm upset. So I'm going to go break in the Rolex store. If I break every watch in that Rolex store where they are not sellable and burn that place down, right. that's me saying I'm anti-establishment. Again, it's violent, it's bad, but it's, I'm standing up for something saying it's, hey, your Rolex is not more important than my life. But Mm -hmm, if I go steal the Rolex and resell it online and and basically turn it into capitalism, which is the root of the problem, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just perpetuating the problem over time. And I think that's what a lot of people who aren't educated on our past battles in the civil rights war, they don't understand that because we've done the looting before and realized it was wrong. There are areas here in LA that never recovered from the 92 riots for Rodney Mm -hmm. King. Right. There are... There are people in the 65 riots here in LA that they've never, there are areas that have never recovered from that. And I don't think people understand that because they, no one knows the history. We're just repeating things every 30 years, every 27 to 30 years. It's literally the same thing happening over and over again. 
Yeah. I do feel like in this instance, because of social media and Mm -hmm. the widespread viewership of, I know Caitlin and I have seen things that we would have never seen otherwise. Mm -hmm. I feel like social media, like aids the problem and is also part of the problem on it. Mm -hmm. right however i feel like this time things may be different and this time more of a change may be possible because of social media do you think that voting that's one of the solutions that i've heard to um, helping create a more solid solid change is you know changing the people in power do you think that that is a way to really help solidify the change? Yes, vote, voting will help. But I think mm-hmm. the, the problem with things kind of being driven by social media is that everything on social media is a fad, right? It is, it is about a hashtag. It's about a feeling good in the moment, right? Everybody wants to feel good about themselves when they're on social media. So I say, yes, go out and vote. Vote for elected officials. But this isn't going to stop with one election. No president or mayor or governor is going to save us. Mm -hmm. This is a person by person situation. So Mm -hmm. we need to have these tough conversations. We need to continue to work with lawmakers. We need to vote every time, not just after there's a riot, not just after 92, not just after 65. And we need to do it every time with these thoughts in mind. We need to have these conversations all the time forever. I think a lot of us, a lot of times we're looking for a quick fix like oh you know what i know the problem i'm gonna get donald trump out of office and that's gonna fix everything like, that's not gonna fix anything mm-hmm. actually it's what's gonna happen is we need to we need to take our future children and teach them so that when they become leaders we can have change that goes longer than just 20 minutes on your tv mm-hmm. or so you can sleep good for one night i hope that makes sense but it just oh yeah that's how i yeah. feel i think we should vote for sure but people have been voting I just think we need to stop saying, well, our leaders will fix it. We need to fix it. Right. It's placing the blame rather than taking ownership. We need to take account of, we need to take ownership of our lives and what we want Mm -hmm. the world to be. We appoint leaders, yes, but we also appoint them for a reason. We're the ones who choose for a reason. And we should exercise that ability a little bit more. Speaking of difficult conversations, that's something that we're really trying to delve into ourselves all the time I think you know like the the white guilt might you might always say like oh I'm not racist so I would never have that conversation but now there's a movement to become anti-racist instead of just not racist so it's having a conversation that you might not typically have before I think a lot of people who have black friends aren't exactly sure the best way that they should be checking in with them while being sensitive. Do you have any advice? Is there like a right thing to say right now? Is there a wrong thing to say? Just remember that they're a person first. Like they're not, let's not identify everyone so hard by color right now. That's the Mm -hmm. thing that I'm a little bit afraid of. I feel like we're identifying people too much by what separates us, right? Right. Let's take a moment. Say, like, I'm your friend. I'm Quan. I'm your friend. So if you mm-hmm. just text me, hey, how are you handling everything? Are you doing okay? I feel like that's a great way to open up a conversation. Now, if you just okay. start throwing different things, how do you feel about the riots? Okay, now I feel like you're like, hey, spokesperson, spokesperson for the Black community, how do you feel about riots? It's like, <laughs> uh, right. I'm just trying to process myself. Or how do you right. feel about protests? How do you feel about rubber bullets? It's like, don't right. attack me. Just ask me as a human who you know, you know, with hike together and talk like, hey, like, yeah. how are you doing? And I think that, especially when people have things on their heart, that's a really easy way to open up the door and you guys can have a tough conversation. If there's anger, just air them out. Mm-hmm. If you have some things you're worried about, like wait for the opportunity, a little bit of an opening and just and ask nicely. And again, they're people, we're people. So if somebody, if you say something I don't like and I need a day to cool off, I don't hate you. I just, mm-hmm. I'm also afraid to go outside too i've got right. things going on they're, they're you know I, I feel nervous as well and i might need some time to process just remember that we're all people and we all have individual emotions aside from the entire movement as well love that that actually makes yeah. me feel so good because i did see there's like a lot of just information that people are throwing out right now and one of the things i saw was a meme and i have been checking in 
with all of my friends just mm-hmm. around the country Everyone. around the world everyone no matter what but i've been saying like the same thing i would to danny just checking in how she's doing than i would to one of my really good black friends and then i saw someone post that it's not okay just to ask like your black friend how they're doing you have to write this like whole paragraph and i was like but i would never talk like these are my friends i would never talk to my friend like that so why am i going to talk to her differently now don't let social media peer pressure change the way you interact on a day-to-day basis with people you already know i feel like everyone is telling people how to do things like a specific list again who is the person making this specific list maybe that's how they would like to be talked to personally And that's Mm -hmm. why I preface everything I say with, this is my opinion of how I think things should be. And I think a lot of us need to take away, like take a step back and again, just remember we're all people. And I know I I have to reiterate that because I'm not some like black person that is so fragile you can't talk to me and you're not some white person Mm -hmm. that's so fragile that like, no, we can have a conversation. We just have to be prepared for the ups and downs that it's going to take. I think it's, right now is very just sensitive for everyone absolutely because it shows that everybody cares right and is starting to maybe care it could be like a little too much you know well, don't punish of- people for caring is all i'm saying like i should like you guys asking me to talk i shouldn't mm-hmm. punish you for asking me to talk you know what i mean like we're punishing right. people right now for just wondering things that's never right. gonna work out. that's well, never we gonna have- we're never gonna progress we you know have this platform and this audience and we don't feel like we are the ones to be preaching to anyone about what they can do how they can help because we still need to all be so educated especially i think within our generation because there are a lot of things that i don't understand and i can't speak on behalf of caitlin that we want to know and we want to learn to move forward help everybody start healing and hopefully Mm -hmm. create change and prevent what history from repeating itself with our younger generations absolutely which i thought was going to be a lot of what happened under president obama but see that's another thing that i I try to touch on is that goes back to not one person can't save us all Mm. right no matter how amazing his intentions are People still, I feel like a lot, because I remember I was 17 when President Obama was elected, right? And I remember the Mm -hmm. excitement. I just, my mom and I just moved back to Chicago. I'm looking around and so many people in different neighbors were so excited, but no one acted. It's not like people went to school more. It's not like people like held more like uh, peaceful marches and and did things to unify. People kind of looked at it as, oh, we have a black president now. So we can like, we can chill out now. Like the world's fine. Everything's okay everything's good and it's not it's we have to continue to push a narrative of getting us to understand each other more and not be like oh all right black people are good now they have a president he's cool and he's mm-hmm. nice i like him he's fun and everything's okay now i feel like we got kind of lazy over those eight years and that's how things kind of took a turn oh that's interesting we all got kind of lazy and i mean I, i'll take ownership too i was 17 going to college having fun you know i didn't care about nothing but yeah. you know. it, it was though it was though like um as you're saying, like people were more relaxed, I guess you can mm-hmm. say, which I feel like was also kind of refreshing at the same time that there wasn't like an understanding of the qu- consequence clearly of, you know, sitting back for a minute and being able to take a deep breath, right? Because mm-hmm. I, from what I understand, there's been a lot of shit going on for a long time. And now we have- like, years, yes a buildup of all of that to this point now where this is this is huge in our lifetime if you span over what we have experienced in our yeah. lifetime we have been around for a lot now it's our responsibility to learn from each other have the difficult conversations and all do the work together i agree i just want to paint a quick picture with oh wait and I always look at this. I don't know if you guys know, but I originally went to school for economics. It's like my favorite thing outside of fitness. Oh, nice. Thing. But in 08, you had the economy in its worth position had been a long time. I know with COVID, we're going through a lot right now. But if you look back on 08, when President Obama won the election, 
people felt so unified because people were also equally suffering across all socioeconomic statuses. I mean, you had, I lived in Palatine at the time, you had Motorola shutting down. So people making $200,000, $300,000 a year are now jobless. My mom has, you know, advanced degree. She can't get a job higher than Starbucks because, not because of her race, but because companies don't have the money to pay anybody. So everyone came together in this time of hurt and pain and really tried to make the world a better place, in my opinion. And I feel like when we got that, when we won that battle, if you will, people were like, you know, and I just need to take a second. I need to breathe. Like, I need to work on building my life back up and work on myself. And a lot of times, I feel like we just didn't really look at civil rights as much anymore. We were, everyone was just focused on rebuilding everything else. And I just think civil rights should always be um, important. It should always be a top, a top two, top three thing that's worked on and talked about outside of our economy or outside of what's in our pockets. I know that about economics. Oh, about me? About you personally. It's funny. I was just saying to Zach last night, we were just chatting about the different situations going on and trying to have like difficult conversations with each other. It's just like an exercise, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I know nothing about economics, but maybe this could be one idea. You, you know, there's that video going around on social media. It's like a little cartoon and it's Jamal and Kevin. Yeah. And it's talking mm -hmm. about systemic racism. Mm -hmm. But I was, I told Zach, I was like, I know nothing about economics, but I feel like it would be really cool if like in the nicer neighborhoods, the like black community or black people could get a, like a cut on their like tax dollars that they pay and then like children could go to schools that have better funding just because that was one thing that I took away from the video. Yeah, I mean, I don't even know if you would have to take it as from as a tax, um, moving tax money around. I just think a lot of schools that are highly inclusive should open them up a little bit more. I mean, if you look at the city of Chicago and the way they do high schools, I think it's super messed up. I mean, you have to test into high schools that certain areas aren't trained on how to get into. So to like get right. into Walter Payton, you have to score a certain test grade, mm -hmm. but the kid is never taught those things. So how are they going right. to get into that school? Right. I think we should open things up and, and stop this kind of like elitist thing with the high schools. And I'm just speaking on Chicago because I, I know Chicago high schools. This is why people run to the suburbs and you see such a mix in a lot of suburban high schools, at least when I was in high school, it was starting to mix more because mm -hmm. you don't have to test into a blue ribbon school. And a blue ribbon right. is one of the highest honors for high schools. You don't have to test in, you can just come. And now there's, there's, there, it kind of levels the playing field a little bit in terms of academic help for the children. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's something that, it's hard to get people to agree to take tax dollars to help anyone ever. Right. Right. It's hard to get anyone to agree to, wait, I have to pay more money to do what? Well, what if this kid doesn't get good grades? I'm not wasting my money on someone else's child. Like, these are the things that I've heard in my life. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and a lot of kids, and also you don't want to tell a kid like, hey, look at this handout I gave you. I gave you this. Because somebody out there will use that against a kid. And if I'm 16 right. and I'm, I got, let's say I got, I got a great ACT score and I'm about to go to, I found I got accepted to Stanford, right? And then you tell me like, hey, aren't you glad that we passed that bill for you? You would have never been here if it wasn't for us. And it's like, all right. Still a cool. way to like. Don't take, right. you know, you take, take, knock it, someone it, down. Absolutely. And it, it takes or away from the accomplishments and stuff. So I think it, it'll be very similar to what happened in this country with um, affirmative action. That was right before a lot of our time, right? A lot before we were adults, but affirmative action was huge, right? So companies had to you know, admit a certain amount of children to certain mm -hmm. schools. They had to hire a certain amount of different, you know, races. But what would happen is you would get into those jobs and get into those schools and someone would be like, well, I got a, this GPA, but you're only here because you're black. Yeah. And that person doesn't even mean it negatively, but it makes you feel less than like, oh, like, okay, I got this. Well, that was I'm... a lot. That was actually a lot of what went on when Obama was president. Oh yeah, like a lot more. I still say I'm gonna say African American because that's just what I. You're okay. good. Like, anyway, don't feel bad about see, that. See, this is where I'm at. Like, no, this is where this good. is why we had don't to talk to you because I'm I'm all kinds good. of like confused and good, trying to understand. Okay, um, that's so like my college that I went to was in Texas. I went to okay. Sam Houston State in Huntsville, Texas. Right, so they have their own. As you know, it's deep Absolutely. deep south and they yeah. you know um 
not many years ago did they just start like accepting African American students, which is like right. difficult to digest in its own realm. But then once Obama became president, the African American enrollment went up and more people were accepted. And you, you would hear talk of people talk of people saying that that's only because Obama is president and people get to be there now for essentially free. We can't, we can't try to help people and then try to hold that help over their head. Right. I think Caitlin had a great idea, but if we do that, I think Caitlin's idea is amazing, but if we do that, we have to also institute a narrative of we can't hold it above someone's head, especially if they succeed using, you know, the, right. the more help, if you will. I Did think you, that the narrative um, needs to be changed overall. <laughs> absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. Juan, did you have any um, scholarships for education based? I, I mean, you're an athlete, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, not really. Uh, I, so my mom and my uh, stepdad and my father, actually, were all in the military. So you get a lot of, sometimes you'll get like small grants and stuff. I went to a private college. Um, I only went to Carthage because I wanted to play football and run track. And I wasn't a good enough athlete in high school to get anything. So I kind of went mm -hmm. there and I got some different you know, deals and stuff based off that. But when I was at school going through, you know, being a young adult outside of my race, just being a young adult, mm -hmm. um, I, I found it very, very tough to see how people assumed I was there because I was an athlete, even though they knew they didn't know that I wasn't like some all state and I wasn't anything. I was just a guy who wanted to play. I, that was my main concern. I wasn't trying to go to the NFL or anything. I just liked to do things. And that's why I was there to do it. And um, it, it was just very tough to have people, you know, assume that because I can catch a football that that's why I'm here. And, you know, mm -hmm. you're so much smarter than me. You know what I mean? Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I watched that another video on social media that like lined up all the like white chilled kids and the black kids and the guy was holding up the hundred dollar bill. And if you, Oh, the you yeah, with the microphone and he talked about, yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, yeah. yeah if, and so to me, I, I mean, that also made me realize I didn't even realize I'm, and I don't want to sound ignorant, but again, I look at everybody with the utmost love and respect yeah. And never am I like, do I, I've never thought the way that I'm learning how people think, right? So it's like mm -hmm. disturbing, disgusting, heartbreaking, all within itself. So after watching that video, I was like, holy shit. Like, I didn't realize that a lot of African-American men are in the schools they're in because of their um, athletic abilities. Because he said, he's like, if we're going to race right now, like basically none of you white kids are going to win. So um, we're going to stagger this. Right. I get it. Was it. Just, yeah. I also, there were some things in that video that it's just hard for me still to like comprehend. Like I know huh? an equal amount of white kids and an equal amount of black kids who grew up in broken homes. Right. right? Especially in our age I, group. Yeah. Yeah, I do understand there's like a, I guess a different advantage for growing and being in that same situation, growing up white versus black. And I don't understand that. So maybe you can shed some light on that for me. Because like, I guess if you, you know, looking at our system, if you take a white male and yeah. a black male who came uh -huh. from similar backgrounds, for some mm -hmm. reason, the white male seems to be doing better financially, out in the world, mm -hmm. and maybe you could shed some light on that for me, being a Yeah, man. um, okay, so take me, for instance, right? Me and uh, another white guy, let's say we marry girls, get, you know, separate, we have kids or whatever. In my personal experience, I've been denied loans. I've been denied tons of opportunities that I've seen some of my white friends that have the same situation as me get approved for. I've been profiled differently. Like for instance, you guys know me. I walked at, I walked to work at 4.30 in the morning every day, right? In the dark. It was one of the things I used to put on my Instagram all the time. But what you guys don't know is every time I walk to work, 
when I see someone sees me walking down the street, they snatch their purse, they're holding it, they're, they're nervous, they're scared. If I reacted the way that I wanted to, at least one out of the 100 times that that happens to me in a given month, it feels like, I would go to jail, right? The, because of the way that black men have to control themselves all the time, I feel like we are always a court, like a half decision away from being in prison. If you look at the prison system, how is it that African Americans only make up 13% of the United States population? 13%, yet we take up over half of the prison system. It's because the deck is stacked against us. We're not all criminals. I know white criminals. I know Hispanic criminals. I know Asian criminals. But how is it that we're always the ones targeted? It's because we're getting hit from so many different angles. So for a time, I worked in a bar, okay? I've had white women say stuff to me like, who are drunk and I'm just trying to get them out of the bar. That's all I'm trying to do. You're, you're drunk. Hey, I'm trying to get you out. If you touch me, I'm going to call the police and then spit in my face and slap me. Damn. So if I choke slam her to the ground, like I'm trained to do, right. you're telling me that I'm going to go to jail. And guess what? It happens. Right. Mm -hmm. So you know I mean? are these experiences something like that, which is totally absolutely fucking uncalled for and unfortunate yeah. and you should be able to defend yourself as yeah. any other person should be able to is this mm -hmm. something that you've experienced more in your adult life or did is this stuff that you were made aware of at, yeah, as a young man too uh, my mother always trained me from probably two to three years old. We would have conversations about the world and stuff. My mom was always, she never like sugarcoated things. Like, you're a kid, you don't need to know this. It was like, no, you're going to know this. Nice. Um, so it's a narrative that I've always known existed. So I've always kind of walked on eggshells with it. Like, I don't put myself in situations where I've seen things go poorly in the past, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I won't allow myself to be in a position where like someone could say I did something when I didn't. Right. I always kind of like wear certain things where I'm remembered being somewhere. Like I, I literally, I, people have literally made jokes like, man, you're like worried about too much stuff. And I'm like, no, nah, I just like don't want to go to jail. I've actually been falsely accused of a very serious crime before. And a lot of people okay. don't know that. And wow. I'll leave it at that. But I was uh, falsely accused of a very serious crime. I was, and I remember, I'm never going to forget when I was sitting in an interrogation room with two cops and they were just talking to me. And they, they were very respectful, great cops. They ended up, you know, mm -hmm taking care of me, things were fine, but I was falsely accused of a situation. I remember I was so terrified I bet. because I'm like, look at this. I didn't even do nothing. And I'm right here. Right. And the thing I was facing is a very long time in jail. And I said, damn, I'm right here. Here I am. Front and center. Wow. I'm Thank right here. Thank you for yep. sharing that. It was like That's four years ago. It was tough, but Hey, you know, and luckily I was able to, you know, talk about it. And luckily I remember things and I had records of things and I knew how to, call and say hey no i was here at this you saw this the security camera shows this this that and i you know the da didn't want to pursue charges you've always been more vigilant because you you're worried about what could possibly happen if you're not always looking out for yourself absolutely and i and i'll even i'll, I'll, I'll really go into it i had a girl once when i was in college this is completely separate from the other situation i was talking about Mm -hmm. This might be like 20, 2011. This girl came to my dorm room at like one in the morning and was like, you know, I really, I really like you, blah, blah, we're like talking. She like starts to, uh, you know, do stuff with me. And I'm, I, I've told this story before. I don't, I don't care. I'm not going to say her name though. But basically halfway through, she goes, oh, we should stop. I said, cool. That's no problem. She's like, wait, how did I get here? Did you, did you drag me here? Oh, shit. And oh, I was my like, gosh. What? I was like, no, like I'm, I you came to my room, like I'm sitting right, like I've been sitting in here all day. Remember that chat roulette? I used to be on there all joking yes. around. With people. I'm like, I've been yes. on chat roulette for like two hours. Like, I don't know what you're drinking a four loco. I don't know what you're talking about. And she's like, What are you are you, are you what are you trying to do to me? And I was like, I uh nothing. And uh long story short, she leaves. The next day she comes up, I'm so sorry. Like, I don't know what was going on with me. I was having like a really rough night. Like, I'm struggling with my morals. And she made it about her life in college currently I'm, I'm struggling with who i'm becoming and i'm sorry i shouldn't have done that and i was like yeah man it's cool and i of course proceeded to block her on facebook and block her number and never talk to her again but oh my uh, gosh and I, I was in fear for the next month or so that she was going to try to say i did something right and it's like these are things that people talk about all the time and 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 i've heard from countless of my friends and it, it's a very real issue
your story is unique to you. It sheds Absolutely. a lot of light on things that everybody needs to understand and know about, including Caitlin and myself. And there's no mm -hmm. better person to be talking to you than you, because I feel like you are perfectly well-rounded in where the places you've lived, you've told us um, stories about your family. So we understand uh -huh. a little bit about your background and you actually were in such an inspiring way out there on the streets during this time when you don't know what's going to happen to you. And instead of taking a route in which you were angry or violent or, you know, being disrespectful to people, you did the complete opposite and you were out there helping and mm -hmm. you were helping a community that you just became a part of. And in doing that, you're helping all of us. Like watching yeah. the, the things that you're saying, watching your social media, it's all been very inspiring and made Caitlin and I want to reach out to you to talk to you because we have like the utmost respect and value you as a person even before this and can't even imagine what you're going through. I, you know, and I, I truly appreciate that. And um, I, I, and I, you guys know me, like, I, I really do appreciate it. Um, but I do want to reiterate something, and I'm going to probably touch on this later today on my social mm -hmm. media. I'm angry too. Okay. Like, okay. I don't, right. I, I don't want people to think I'm not angry. Like, mm -hmm. and, I, and I bring him up the time, my time as a bouncer, I was a bouncer for two summers in Chicago, worked in uh, Lakeview and uh, River North. You know, I've been, you know, when people get drunk, that's when they become who they really are, right? While I was facing this, you know, dealing with the issue with this charge and this, this whole thing took over a year to deal with, right? So I'm working at a bar at the time and working at the gym. Just, you know, this is a couple of years ago. So, I mean, this, uh, mm -hmm. I look the same as I did then. I'm dealing with all this, I'm dealing with this accusation. And then I'm in the bar and this is a different situation. You know, this, these two guys, two white dudes are kind of arguing. I'm like, hey guys, it's time to go. You know, you guys have had too much to drink, just like the protocol asks. And then, uh, and I'm going to say this and you can blurt it off if you want, but I remember, I'm never going to forget when the dude turned to me and said, you know, how about you uh, get your hands off me, nigger, you, uh, and go get a real job. And then his friend said he probably can't and laughed. Mm. Jeez. And um, I just, you know, and again, you guys know me, I always have a smile on my face. So I did what I always do. Right. And I uh, smiled and I got my manager and he got them out of there. But it was very yeah. chill about it. I always look at people when they're drinking as kind of like a guide of what they really think or what they really feel. And I've literally, I've also had it on the flip side where I go out to a bar and I've had, I've literally had this happen and no joke. It, it, people are gonna think it's funny, but other guys know about this. I've literally been at a bar and a girl come up to me and grab my crotch and say, I've never had a black dick before. Oh shit. <laughs> What do you do? Uh, I know guys who are into that and they think it's like fun or whatever. Um, I do. I know guys like that. Um, I've always right. told everyone I've dated, if you're only dating me because I'm African-American or black or whatever, you're trying to fulfill some experiment in your head, like kindly fuck off. Yeah. And I've even told, you know, as I've been in more serious relationships, I've always said, like, I'm not here to be your science experiment. Because a lot of the areas I've lived in as an adult, I've just run into that so many times. Uh. Like, oh, I just want to see what it's like. What What's like? That's difficult. Right. Just those type of narratives that, like, that's what I mean when I say I, I'm expected in society to always maintain this sense of calm. Like, I always right. have to be chill or I'm an angry black man on a rampage. Right. And it's like, how, how much can you take? Right. But, hey, I always, I'm always expected to smile and, and just skip along through the street. Yeah. I mean, you, think you always do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do my best. I do, I do my best to stay calm, but I mean, you know, I have my nights where I'm upset. And so when this happened, of course, I would damn said I was furious. Right. But I also understand that I can't destroy everything around me. Mm -hmm. I can go out to a peaceful protest and be there and let my voice be heard. I'm like, okay, well, I'm not the best. You know, I don't really know how to organize a protest, but I can speak on my social media. I have enough people around on there who maybe the right person will see it and I can help someone understand. So mm -hmm. I speak on there. But then also within my own community, within the black community, I'm being told that I'm a sellout. I'm an Uncle Tom. Like, oh, listen to the way this, this, uh, this nigga talks. He doesn't sound black. 
you know, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. So that's why I say this is such a complex situation. And that's why I feel like if you're going to ask a friend how they're doing, ask them as the friend that they are. Mm -hmm. Because we're getting hit from so many angles. I just don't I, understand. It's just a lot. I just Go don't under, Sorry to interrupt. I no, you're good. You're good. Understand how you could have people from the African American community mm -hmm. telling you that you're a sellout when you're actually doing what everyone is asking for. I feel like everyone is asking for people to come together, be allies together, genuinely have each other's backs and by them preaching that this is what they want but then ridiculing someone who's doing it seems counterproductive um i can actually explain it perfectly it's another part of black history um it's a part of systemic racism so we take it all the way back to the slave days all right i don't know if you guys have seen the movie um django unchained it's a funny version of what really happened yeah. though mm -hmm. um there were there were house slaves and there were slaves in the field there were slaves in the house that were given more things, right? They were still slaves, but they mm -hmm. maybe they were given a little more education. Maybe they could sit with their, their slave master. Maybe they could speak openly, things like that, right? So over time, as slaves were freed and people go on in their different race, our race has always been pitted against itself, right? So, oh, you only get that because you're a light skin. You only, like, oh, so a lighter skinned black person. You you only get that because of the way you talk or you're not really with us. You want to be one of them. Like it's something that was implanted within our community that we had no control over. I just challenge people within our community to try to look past that. Mm -hmm. You don't know what I've gone through, but you look at where I live and how I speak and think that I am trying to not be black. And that's not the case. My mother's from the South side of Chicago and my mom sounds just like I do. And she was bullied in high school based off the way that she talks. And she didn't learn that from anybody, but you know how some people are just born and they talk different? Yeah. That's how I she mean, talks. She just sounds different from people in her community, but she was always looked at as someone who was trying to be something she's not. And I'm not trying to be white. I'm just trying to be Quan, and that's me. This is how I sound. <laughs> right. this is and the, that's this all is you can be. Am. Exactly. And I think a lot of times, so, so right now, as I speak out, people don't, some people may not respect what I say because they don't feel like I'm black enough. Or, oh, you... You've date, you date white women, so you don't really like black women. I've dated every type of woman. Mm -hmm. I'll say that. Right. I don't care what your race is. Well, I, like I, think, I think who you date also is part of our generational differences and that we are more accepting of one another. And that's like a perfect example of it right there. I mean, oh, yeah. I have plenty of friends in interracial relationships, and I look at it as one of the most beautiful things. So... It is, but I also want people, I just want to say for myself that I don't look down upon black women. I know black women have a struggle that is their own as well. And I feel like mm -hmm. their con black women are constantly looked down upon. And my, my, my sister is a black woman. My mom is a black woman. My aunts, mm -hmm. you know, I, I just feel like it's so hard to have a general conversation without getting into the intricacies of each struggle within the community. You know, you have the community, you have the, 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 um, the homosexual community within the black community that, that is completely just brutalized all the time right. within right. our own community. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, not, mm -hmm. not even going to the real world. And I think that's wrong. I just feel like, and I've been saying this whole time, if you have something you want to say, turn the camera on and sit in front of it with your name and you in front of it. Mm -hmm. Don't piggyback off my video because you don't like 20% of what I said. If you don't like it, don't send me things saying, you need to know your history. When I used to get in trouble as a kid, I was forced to read books about our history for hours. Mm -hmm. And it actually became a thing I liked to do because I wanted to understand why Emmett Till happened. Wink at a white woman and they, they drown you and beat you to death and throw you in a ditch. I wanted to know why that happened. Mm -hmm. But now that I know, it, it makes me understand, okay, when I'm out here and I deal with going to visit some friends in St. Louis and being with a white woman there and being called a, a nigger there and the woman not defending me. And I'm like, why aren't you, why didn't you just say like, that's not right or whatever? Why is it that when I'm in, when I'm on the South side, hanging out with family, they're like, oh, you don't come around here a lot. Do you not like the neighborhood? 
I never said that. I'm also not from the neighborhood. I, I grew up all over <laughs> as a, in the military. I'm a military brat. Like I didn't grow up here. So this isn't the place that I like to go hang out. Right. I like to come see you guys, but I don't know everybody outside. Like uh, these aren't the kids I grew up with. Like there's nothing about the area. I just don't know you guys like that. Right. I would like to know you if you didn't make me feel bad about myself every time I got out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, then, but then I'm being a sensitive little bitch. No. You feel me? No, no, no. I'm just saying yeah. the responses that come from all these conversations within different races and different situations and, you know, stuff like that. When I'm working to export it, I'm being too sensitive about being black. I'm like, no, that person clearly said something racist to me. No, you're being too sensitive. I'm not being too sensitive. Right. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you just start to get to the point where you're just like, all right, well, I'm going to deal with each day as it comes. Do you think that with everything going on right now that it it's going to get worse before anything gets better? And what I mean by worse is that I have this fear that things are people are going to be more violent towards each other. And I don't know why I feel that way. I just feel like this isn't the end of any of the violence or the rioting or any of that, just because it feels calmed down right now, kind of is maybe like a calm before a bigger storm. I just would hate to see people turning on each other because of misinformation, lack of education, angers and frustrations, because I just have this weird feeling about it all. Um, I would say, I don't know if it's going to get worse, but I feel like history will continue to repeat itself if people don't start to become more understanding. Um, like I said, pe the world felt like this in 65 and, and in 92. There was fear and there were riots mm -hmm. all over the United States during 92. But the coverage right. is a little different, right? Because the narrative is easily controlled when you don't have people with cameras on all the time. I think Will mm -hmm. Smith said it the other day. I think he said, racism isn't new. There's just a camera. Now. Right, it's being recorded. So people have been getting jumped and brutally beaten on both sides for years. People have been, a lot of st the stuff we're seeing on TV has literally been happening since, for a very long time, let's just say that. Um, right. So I don't know if it's going to get worse. I think what's going to happen is there may be more outrage because it's more exposed. I, I, I'm glad a lot of this is being shown because I think a lot of people think that we live in this world that's a little better than it is, and, it, and it's not. Like these, the fears that I that I, I'm hearing from other people are fears that I've had my entire life. Every day that I go mm -hmm. outside, since I was two or three years old, when it was explained to me, I've had these fears for almost 25 years now because I'm about wow. to be 29. So like, I think it's just understanding what's possible but also doing our part to change it over time but it's not going to change in a month it's not going to change in a year it's going to change over the course of our lives see i feel like there's always been a distrust towards um humans as a whole and police officers like mm -hmm. all people of all races mm -hmm. so i feel like right now it's super I'm going to use the word exasperated and I'm not an African man, but I look at police officers, not all like you guys are all these terrible people, but I'm more hesitant to feel respect for this group of people who I'm seeing more and more videos of these senseless horrific acts of violence because more people are posting now on social media videos yeah. that they've been holding on to for a long time mm -hmm. and oh. i'm watching this now and i want to figure out how to be an advocate for you know change within the whole protocol of what it is to be a police officer like like the law everything needs to fucking change i don't know who's big enough or what voices are powerful enough to do something like that but coming from a you know little white girl who doesn't know much i distrust well, you, you're, the, don't put yourself down you're not that's not that's not what you are you're a person <laughs> that is trying to figure out the world around you well yeah thank well you. I we were actually that. we were actually talking about this the other day kwan and I remember my dad sitting me down when I was like 
getting my license at like 16 or whatever. And he was like, you know, if it's nighttime and there's like no other cars around and you're going to get pulled over, he's like, don't stop. Just come straight home and like, we'll deal with it when you get here. But like, I think that there's been distrust with police for a long time. And in that incident, like, of course, like rape was like what we were worried about. But like, I just think that the distrust, distrust with police has been going on for a long time. I'm confused right now because I don't know that like defunding the police program for the answer, nation no. is the answer because no matter what, we're going to need police. Like we do need a system that makes sense. I almost feel like it makes more sense to get like a higher caliber of police officers like on the force that are educated you know what i mean and i don't know what the answer is that's just Uh the thought that goes through my head well i read something where like a lot and this is might sound fucked up and i don't really care but i um read something that said that a lot of police officers are uh basically people who couldn't get other careers and it was like a simple process to become a police officer so um, kind of like along with what caitlin says is like a uh, quality versus quantity better screening processes like what is taking place can't fucking take place anymore okay you guys ready uh-huh. yeah <laughs> okay um like, shut so up. my uncle Lavelle no 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 not that my uncle Lavelle my uncle Lavelle has was a police officer for 25 years CPD mm-hmm. his wife Priscilla is still a police officer 30 years in okay police aren't the problem and I'm going to tell you why we cannot judge okay. anybody off of a 15 second video I literally make my living on social media but we can't we can't do it this way because both of you if you guys are outside somewhere doing your thing, minding your own business, and I come up to you, I push you and spit in your face. What are you gonna do? That's a great question. Cry. What am I? What are you? What are you I cry? Was say okay. cry. <laughs> okay. Let's say I'm not a big. Let's say I'm not this big person. Let's say I'm someone you guys size. I come up to you and I spit in your face and push you. What are you? What are you gonna do? I'd be like, Kate, Danny, Caitlin go and get I, her. <laughs> yeah, Caitlin and I react differently. <laughs> I'd probably well, uh, throw a punch. <laughs> Okay. No, I mean, I would not, I would not put up with someone coming into my face like that. Absolutely okay. not. And then what I'm saying is there are racist cops, right? And there are a lot mm-hmm. of them, of course, but there are racist people in Fortune 500 companies. There are racist teachers. There are racist janitors. There are racist people at fast food places. There are racist mm-hmm. car dealers. There are racist people everywhere. So the war okay. should not be against the police. Right. Because, and guess what? Police are people. So some police are, are going to engage in criminal activity because it benefits them as a person. It's a person by person moral issue. Now the thing that the police we have to work on is this whole cover for my brother thing. So like if I'm a cop and you're a cop and we commit a crime, this whole covering for each other thing, we have to change that narrative. But okay. if I'm standing and you're peacefully protesting and you know, I'm told my job today, remember there are black, white, so many different races of cops. My job is to move you guys back. So I'm walking forward, back up please, back up please back up please and then i turn and there's a bottle on fire thrown at me and i'm my, i'm on fire my teammates trying to put me out and then there's some guys with two middle fingers up like yeah fuck you police pigs mm-hmm. i'm fucking that kid up i'm telling you right now i'm whooping his ass i don't care mm-hmm. what he's there for you're not gonna throw a fucking on fire bottle at me right and I, I get what you're saying. To look at it as, because like I think people need to look at it as the disrespect that we're allowed to give to people in authoritative positions in our generation is not acceptable. Mm-hmm. You can't go to your professor in college and call them a bitch because they gave you homework you don't want, and that's shit that we were raised doing. You know, we've all seen right. that kid in class and people doing that. I just think we need to take accountability for certain situations. Like now, if an order comes in, so okay, here's a, here's another here's one where it's the other way. President Trump wanted to go do his photo op. So he had all those people tear gassed and shot. That's fucked up. Right. And I bet you there are cops who are part of that team that didn't shoot. They just probably stepped back and were like, fuck, I don't want to do this. Right. And there are cops who have turned in their badges because of the things that they were asked to do. I just don't want to make police public enemy number one when they right. didn't. 
police don't do their job right now, then the National Guard gets called in. So they're like, I could either do my best to manage the situation or a bigger threat is coming, you know. And then who's the National Guard? This is the other problem. Right now, I have my windows closed because there are helicopters circling. National Guard is very strong, like a block from my house. Mm, Humvees, everything. I mean, there's got to be at least 200 soldiers right outside of my house. Helicopters literally flying around right now. Mm Mm-hmm. I was up there with those guys. Mm-hmm. They're like 19. I know. 20, 21. These aren't mm-hmm. people are like, the military's coming. You mean these kids? The, like, this isn't the Navy SEALs. This isn't the rock and this fast is their period training. With, like, jacked up and like a, a gun. Like this is a these are young people. And of course there are older soldiers of higher higher rank, of course, but these are young people coming in who feel the same way we feel. Right. Again, right. they're not the enemy their people right right well no i don't so i don't think that police are the ones to blame i don't think people should be doing hateful things to them the way i look at it is similar hopefully there's a change kind of people are kinder to each other from a you know inherent inherent level from this point but when you look at like the shift from people distrusting like big corporations and going back to more of like a ma and pa um, way of supporting and buying things for their family. I'm hoping that within our system now, something similar is created where, you know, we're not going to trust these people to 100% help us anymore except the ones who you have you have to like earn the respect you have to like earn the trust again and hopefully the the police officers who are engaging in this illegal activity and racially profiling and doing all this aren't going to succeed in the roles that they're in anymore and things can go back to a way of just what's right and what's kind and i might live in rainbow land and that's fine, but, that, but, but that's like what, that. but that, but that's like what my hope is. Like, I know yeah. my, like, I also, Caitlin and I kind of struggle with like our part and like what we can do to help because although yes, women, as women, we are still kind of an oppressed culture as well. I'm a fucking loud woman. I know that if I see something, regardless of if it's going to be putting my life in danger or not, I will always speak up. I will speak Mm -hmm. up on behalf of humanity. I will speak up on behalf of what is right. So we have to figure out, and I take a responsibility on myself to understand how to make more people do that who are able to. And I think that's, I think that's great. But I do want to say, you, you made a comment at the beginning saying the world to return to basically like, we can have faith, right? That's never been a thing. Well, And I know, I know for your perspective, it may have felt like, and again, I'm not coming at you personally. I'm just saying that like, the world didn't take a turn at any point, right? There's just been levels and systems in place for the entire existence of our country and other countries, right? Mm -hmm. So with, like, the police, I actually don't have a problem with police. Like, I I trust most cops, and if there's something going on that I don't like, I'm going to turn my phone on and live stream it. Like, that's just, like, back in my mind. I'm like, oh, okay, like, I'm just going to live stream this now. I think in terms of, like, what you can do in your, your part, I think stuff like this, having conversations with people publicly, um mm-hmm. understanding how things are built so i know you, you made a comment about people returning to mom and pop stores right you guys work in mm-hmm. social media but you know what really happens though and, I, and this is going to be slightly off topic but those because big brands know that people want to work with mom and pop stores they buy the mom and pop store and leave the right. name right so like people because the public has a outcry for something all people are going to do is just change the covering to make themselves feel better in the moment. And that's kind of what I was touching on earlier with uh, how that social media outrage is coming out. People are also in the same breath, they're just trying to show that they care without really doing anything to make change. So Mm -hmm. you guys are doing a great job already. Open conversations with people of color, having, having them on, you don't, you can have someone else on after me and just know they might come off angrier they might come off softer. They might not, they might be afraid to, they not, may, may not want to speak at all. Mm-hmm. I think understanding what people's political policies truly are as we're voting for them, I think we're a little late on this presidential election because 
it's only Biden and Trump at this point. So this, but I'm just saying we're a little late, so we can't we can't look at the primaries like we could have before and said, okay, right. what does this person stand for? But we, you know, we 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 kind of go back. We look at the aldermen within our cities. We look at you know the mayors. We we kind of we just really do our due diligence on each person that we appoint to power. That's another mm-hmm. way we can help. Um, donating money to the NAACP, you know, to different uh, the different Black Lives Matter uh, sectors in within the community. But also with Black Lives Matter, from my perspective, we need to find a way to get a, a leader. There's no like leader of Black Lives Matter right now. It's more okay. of a hashtag than an organization. I'll say that. Please condemn me. I don't care. I'll say it. It's more of a hashtag and not, a, and not an organization. We need to make an organization with a president, with a vice president. Mm-hmm. We need to have an office somewhere. Like I need to be able to be like, hey, you know what? I need to go to the Black Lives Matter office and la and have a conversation with the la leader right well we need to put systems in place and everybody's like anti-system uh, no we need systems so that we can change things when needed so that there's an mm-hmm. easier path or a straight shot like i want to change this about police i think internal affairs should crack down on on reports of brutality and reports of racism so i'm calling uh kwan from black lives matter and he's gonna call internal affairs and they're gonna have a conversation they're gonna get those officers right. we're gonna do a report bang bang fired whatever we gotta do just suspension whatever we get this thing going i think I that, love that when systems are when the right systems are put in place then that's when the magic happens i think the right. issues here are broken well, yeah. systems outdated i think that systems. the systems outdated. need to be constantly looked at otherwise and reevaluated otherwise they will become Outdated, I mean, we're you know? still following a constitution that makes no fucking sense in today's world whatsoever. It does not translate very well, no. <laughs> and no one, like, who is the person? Who, like, I, I mean, and again, it goes back to a very, very history enriched reason of why all of this is happening. But I just feel like we all need to be doing more i just think honestly the short term is don't let this die when the fat ends truthfully right mm-hmm. right like i think you we have to continuously bring things up and have conversations and also there's always going to be news about this right there's always going to be something coming up so i think we always having conversations when something breaks we talk about it even right. if you don't know what the facts yet just openly talk about what people are going through i think that'll mm-hmm. be a really great first step and also, we're teaching each other just to have patience with each other. Like, that's, that's what we're lacking today. As of right now, no one has patience. Right. Everyone's just so pissed off. It does seem like the patience, to me at least, is getting, like, a little bit better. Hopefully, it will continue to as the rage kind of surpasses a little bit. I want us to redirect the rage, though, into doing more. Yeah, I, I how, just want to how how do we how do you light that fire under people's asses you can't that's the thing if you care about it you should already have a fire that's true i don't need to mm-hmm. convince somebody to care but like they should not already convincing care. them to care convincing like like flowing someone has to like flow the redirect someone has to like great now we've burnt down a lot of businesses the city of chicago and where you are there's a lot of fucking damage and lot, we saw yes. that rage and we literally saw fire so like who is the person what is what do we need to do to help the flow and the redirect of the anger into the power of the people to keep it going share the narratives you believe in we have the share culture in social media, right? So if someone makes a video about things that you care about, share that. If someone wants to do a live video with you, let them do that. Like amplify the voices of the people you believe in. So let's say, well, I'll use one of our mutual friends. Let's say Phoenix made a video about something and it was about everything that happened. Amplify mm-hmm. her on all channels that you can amplify. Send it to your Got friends it. that have two million followers and amplify that voice. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, this isn't about growing social medias. I'm just saying, if someone has 2 million followers, hey, we know at least 10% of those people are really going to pay attention. Or 5% right. are really going to pay attention. So that's 5% of a million. That's a lot of people. 
Right. That's a lot of people we can touch. Like fifty thousand people. That's a lot of people we can we can get information out to. Right. You know, so it's just, and we have this. to understand that there's not going to be a silver bullet for this. This is just, it's a long battle, and we just try to push the information that we can. Right. Awesome. That's the tangible thing I can tell you. And also, like I said, contacting leaders really helps. The leaders that are in power currently. Yes, you can't reach the president. I mean, I don't even think his people can reach him. At this <laughs> I don't point. even think the president can reach but, the president you know, at this but point. That, but. And, that's the, and that's the thing, but we can reach some of the leaders of the NAACP. That organization has been around 100 years. We can talk to them. Right. We call, yeah. Go on LinkedIn. I bet you can find everybody's email on LinkedIn for that whole organization. Send them an email. That's a, that's Send a them your resource. idea. Set up, like if there's a petition you believe in, start it yourself and share it. Get 10 of your friends to share it. 10 of our friends, that's 200,000 followers right there. Right. Mm -hmm. I've signed and if so many 100 petitions. people sign a petition, it'll start to grow. This week, I feel like I've signed so many petitions. My thumbs were like, <laughs> even though that's like a small price to pay. I was just like, all of them that were coming my way that like, you know, made sense for what I support and believe in. I was like, hell yeah, here's my name. Here's my address. Here's my phone number. Give me a call. I'd love to learn and hear more about all of this and see what Absolutely. else we could do. And to people out there who may be feeling like they're tired of seeing all this, I, and I know people have been very harsh about that, you know, online about, if you're tired, you're blah, blah, blah. I'm going to make it very simple for you. If you're tired of doing these things, just remember the faces of the people who are dead. Mm -hmm. Just remember that they were killed just mm -hmm. for living their life every day and how you would feel if someone you loved was killed just for living their life. And not to mention yeah. there's people that have died for these pro in these protests and these riots. Yeah. There are people who are um, maimed, losing eyeballs from these rubber bullets. There are people yeah. who have scars that will never go away, um, broken, you know, broken shoulders from being pulled, broken kneecaps from being slammed. I don't know if you've ever seen a broken kneecap, but that's an injury I would never want. Just to cut it off. Um, Donald even shattered. I've broken, I've broken everything from you know what this I'm saying? situation. They, just mm -hmm. take it take the media hype out of it and just take it and look at it from a personal perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you should never run out of energy to fight for equality. Simple and plain. There's a lot of people who will finally have found their voice and let's just amplify those voices. And if you don't agree with someone, that's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, don't have to amplify that voice, but amplify the voices you believe in. Don't attack anyone for what they say. Cause if we, if we, uh Oh, if we keep, can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah, we can hear okay, you. Okay, sorry, my mom called. If you keep, um, <laughs> if you keep, um, my mom. if you keep account, <laughs> all right, oh God, if we keep attacking people when we don't agree with them, when we keep cancel culture going, mom, oh my God, we're going to be, we're never going <laughs> to make, mom, I'm on the darker, Zoom call. <laughs> right? Don't attack people for, if you disagree with them. We can't allow cancel culture to quiet people's voices. Don't attack, don't get mobs of people to attack people. We need to have conversations, we need to care, we need to change this narrative. It's not us against them, it's us trying to build a better world and ending racism. However we can do it, we're gonna end it. It's not against anybody, no, we're ending it. There's no room for that, you're done. Right. Let's just get rid of it. I hope that helps. Love it. And thanks for having me on today, guys, I appreciate you. Thanks Thank for you, coming Quan. on. Yeah. We love I you. I hope for... a little bit. You helped us more than we could ever put into words and we love you and we're happy that you're safe and we'll talk to you off camera. <laughs> Perfect. Please do. I'll be here. All right. Love you. Love you, Kwan. Thanks for listening. Remember, the door to the dollhouse is always open. Follow us on Instagram at once upon a dollhouse and our blog is once upon a dollhouse dot com. Have a topic you want us to doll talk about? You can email us at dolls at onceuponadollhouse.com. Also, we will have a follow-up blog post to this interview on onceuponadollhouse.com where you can also find a link to our secret Facebook group so you too can be, become a part of our difficult conversation. Stay beautiful. The end. And they lived happily ever after at least until next week.